All right, now we're going to be talking about the nature of light. And um, we're going to start by talking about one of the ways that you can measure the speed of light. Um, you, uh, you can take a light source, seen here, and then have a rotating wheel. Um, and then the teeth of the wheel block the light that is uh, reflected when, um, when the wheel is rotated at the, light, the rate that matches the time to get to and from the mirror. So the light travels here and back, and then it blocks the reflection. So if you can get the wheel to rotate at the, time, at the speed so that the reflection is always blocked, then that tells you, um, you can use that to calculate the speed of light. Now, there are three different methods for light to travel from one source to another, and we're going to be, well, one of them is rather straightforward. Light just, for instance, from the sun just reaches the, um, reaches the upper atmosphere of the earth. There's nothing between the sun and the upper atmosphere of the earth, so light just travels directly. Um, that's not so terribly interesting because it will travel, uh, you know, it will travel roughly in a straight path. The next mode is to travel through something. And I want to point out that this was worded very carefully. It just reaches the upper atmosphere of the Earth because um, if you have light traveling through the upper at atmosphere of the Earth, it is traveling through a medium. It is traveling through the atmosphere. Um, but of course, light can also travel through the glass in your window. Um, and when it does this, it's going to bend, and that is called refraction. Um, and the third way that light can reach um, that light can reach your eye. Um, or travel to some other location is to reflect. So light from a mirror can be reflected off the mirror and reach your eye. Um, so we will talk about both refraction and reflection. We're going to start with the law of reflection. The law of reflection states that the, the angle of, of reflection equals the angle of incidence. So um, light travels at some, it travels along and it hits some surface and it is going to bounce off at the same angle. Um, it's going to bounce off at an angle equal to the um, when it started at. Um, so here, this is showing how we usually measure the way that the light rays go. You look at a line perpendicular to the surface, and the incident ray makes the same angle with that surface as the reflected ray. That is what the law of reflection says. Now, we could equally have well have chosen this angle and that angle instead, um, but by convention, we choose the angle relative to the perpendicular to the surface, not the angle of the surface itself, or not, not the angle relative to the surface. All right, so when you have a uh, rough surface, what happens is that because the light rays, so here we have a bunch of different light rays traveling in on and hitting this rough surface, and they are reflected off of the rough surface. Since the surface is rough, what that means microscopically is that it is not flat. There are a lot of bumps and wiggles, and so it is always going to be reflected off of the surface at the same angle that it was incident upon the surface, but because the surface is rough, the, um, the reflections are going to be at all sorts of different uh, angles, and that is um, that diffuses the light. It is spread out. It is not going at the same angle. You don't get a, a pretty image because the surface is rough. Um, now, when a uh, um, when so here you can see another schematic. So you have light shining down on a piece of paper. The surface of the paper microscopically is rough. Now, when you handle a piece of paper, it doesn't it doesn't feel rough, but it is rough compared to the scale of the light itself. Because light waves, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about the duality between waves and particles and rays. We're not there yet. But um, the wavelength of light, um, a visible light, is going to be somewhere around 500 to 700 nanometers. And if you look at a piece of paper on the scale of 500 to 700 nanometers, what you will see is that it is rough on that scale. So there are a lot of bumps and wiggles that are, um, that are large compared to 500 nanometers. So if you shine light on a piece of paper, um, then it is going to be scattered off at many different angles. Whereas if you shine light on a mirror, um, it is a smooth surface, at least on the scale of the, of the light wave. 
Um, so it is a smooth surface, so light is going to bounce back, and, um, and all of the light rays that are incident upon the surface are going to go off in the, the, roughly the same direction, well, at the same angle that they did before, as opposed to a rough surface, which is going to scatter them. And here, this shows up poorly because of the way that the, um, that the image is processed, but if you look at moonlight over uh, uh, or sunlight reflected on a water, uh, on some type of water, you still, it's smooth enough that you're still going to be able to see some image, um, but the image is spread out because the surface of water is not exactly smooth. All right, so here you can see what happens when you, uh, when you look at light waves, rays bouncing off a mirror. So for instance, when you look at yourself in a mirror, you have a ray bouncing off of, a ray bouncing off the top of your head, and it comes in at the same angle relative to the normals of the surface that it comes, it is reflected at the same angle relative to the normal of the surface that it came in on. So then it can travel and hit your eyes. Um, or you can look at light from your feet, if you are able to see your feet in the mirror. And it will also be reflected at the same angle um, that it was relative to the normal that it was incident upon the mirror. Um, so you can actually use this to figure out, for instance, how far down you can see yourself in the mirror. Um, so what you see, so the, what you see in the mirror is where this ray comes in towards your eye and this ray comes towards your eye. So the way that you look at a, figure out where a, an image is, is that you project back that ray and this one is not showing up on the screen. You, what you see is it looks to you as if the light came from the direction the light is coming from the whole time. So you see, it appears to you as if the light traveling here came not from the mirror, but from the location where, a location behind the mirror. So in your perspective, all the light looks like it's coming from somewhere else. Um, and we're going to be doing this with um, when we get to ray diagrams as well. Um, you're going to look at where it looks like the light is coming from. So when the light hits your eye, where does it look like the light was coming from? All right, so um, here you can see a light, tra a light ray traveling and hitting a mirror. And in this case, the mirror has, a, you have... A, two perpendicular mirrors, so light comes in, hits this mirror, and bounces off. Now this angle it is, let me, this angle is equal to this angle. It comes in, it hits, um, it hits at a certain angle, and it comes off. Now here, because this is 90 degrees, then this angle is the whole tra everything in the so this has to add up to 90 degrees so this angle is 90 degrees minus that angle and that means that this angle is the same as these two angles and then this has to add up to 90 degrees. So this angle is the same as this angle, which means that this angle is the same as this angle, and this angle is the same as this angle and these two angles. All right, so now, we have this triangle, and you can see that the light that comes in comes out parallel to the direction that it came from. So if you have two perpendicular mirrors, the light that comes in and hits the, the mirrors 
is reflected parallel to how it came in from. All right. Refraction is the process where light moving from one medium to another is bent. Um, so light has a different effective speed in different um, media. So light moves slower, for instance, when traveling through glass than it moves through, um, than it moves through air. So if you look at a fish tank, so light moves slower inside water than it does in air. So at the air, um, at the air water interface and the air, well, the air glass interface and the glass water interface, because it is changing the light, the effective speed of light is changing, um, then you get refraction. Um, and re so the light rays are bent when they go through these surfaces, which means that if you look at the side of an aquarium, you actually will see fish in a couple different areas. Um, you can see the fish from a couple different angles, and you might see the same fish in two different places because of the refraction of light. Um, so here you can see what this is zooming in on one surface, and we describe the refraction of light using Snell's law. And Snell's law says that the index of refraction, this is a property of the material, of one material times the sine of the angle which uh, the, um, the light hits, the, uh, the sine of the angle at which the light hits the surface, equals the index of refraction of the second material times the sine of the angle of the, of the, uh, the light with respect to the surface of the second material. So when you travel through, because the index of refraction is changing, then um, you are actually bending the light. So the first one shows what happens when you enter a medium with a higher index of refraction. A higher index of refraction means that the speed of light is slower. So you can, the speed of light in a medium is equal to the speed of light divided by the index of refraction of that medium. So the effective speed of light changes. So here, when light goes from something with a lower index of refraction to a higher index of refraction, it bends towards the perpendicular. And when it's traveling in the opposite direction, light goes um, from something with a higher index of refraction to a lower index of refraction, it is going to tilt away from the perpendicular. Now, one of the tricks in physics is to figure out ways of checking your understanding and checking your answer um, to make sure you haven't made a dumb algebra mistake because the number one type of mistake that people make is dumb algebra mistakes. Me too. Um, so the way that I think about this is as if you are pushing a lawnmower um, and you hit the side and you go from the, the grass to the sidewalk. So when you are uh, pushing a lawnmower, the, the lawnmower moves faster on the sidewalk than on the grass. So I'm going to start back here. These are the two wheels of my lawnmower, and I'm going to travel until I hit the grass. Or sorry, I'm traveling from the grass to the sidewalk. So now this, my hand in front hits the sidewalk first. And when my hand in front hits the sidewalk, it starts traveling faster. So that means it's gonna, that I'm gonna turn this way. So when I, here I'm gonna put my, let's see, I'm going from the grass to the sidewalk. And here, this, this hand hits the, the sidewalk first. This one starts traveling faster before this wheel hits the, hits the sidewalk. So the lawnmower turns away from the perpendicular because the first wheel to hit the, the sidewalk starts going faster. Now I'm doing the opposite. Let me put my two fingers here. This is my, my lawnmower. All right. 
Now I'm going from the sidewalk to the grass. When this guy hits, when my thumb hits the grass, my index finger is still, my thumb slows down, my index finger speeds up, so I am rotating towards the perpendicular. Um, because my index finger doesn't slow down until it hits the grass. That's how I keep track of it. So every time I do one of these problems, I look at the problem and see if I can make sense of it by using my little lawnmower analogy. All right, once we start with Snell's Law, we can get a really cool phenomenon called total internal reflection. So, if we start with Snell's Law, I'm actually going to just start with the equation itself. So we have n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2. This is Snell's Law. So if I am going to, um, I'm going from medium 1 to medium 2, let's calculate what my angle is. So sine theta 2 equals n1 over n2 sine theta 1. So if n1 is greater than n2, the index of refraction in the medium I start in, if that is larger than um, if the index of refraction in the second one is larger, in the first thi thing, if where I start is larger than the index of refraction in the second thing, then there will, will be values for which I cannot find, uh, I will not get an angle of reflection. It does not exist. At those points, the, um, all of the light gets trapped inside of the original medium. That is called total internal reflection. And this is just showing those diagrams. Um, so here we have higher index of refraction, lower index of refraction. So if you have a sufficiently high index of refraction here, then um, there is, it, it is possible as you change the, so you have to change an incident angle. And then at some point you get to, and it, Sine increases as theta increases. So if you have a wide enough angle, there's going to be an angle where the light, instead of, um, instead of leaving the medium, travels out at exactly 90 degrees. So there, um, that would say that sine of theta uh, 2 is exactly 1. Um, and if you go any larger at all, all of the light is reflected. So this is the angle where theta 2 is 90 degrees, is the critical angle. So I can then write sine theta c equals n1 over n2 sine theta 1. Um, and anything that has a larger angle than that relative to the normal is going to be reflected and, and it is, the light ray is not going to leave the medium. Um, so at any angles greater than the critical angle, light will not leave the medium. All right, so this has a lot of applications and you know about them even if you didn't know that you know about them. Snell's Law is cool. Uh, all the kids are doing it. So here you have fiber optics. So fiber optics work because you have fibers that have very high indices of refraction. And then if you have uh, light that enters at a grazing angle, so it is at a large angle relative to the normal, it's not going this way, it's going along the fiber. When it hits, it reflects, and wherever it travels, it reflects. But because, um, because we can then bend this fiber, what it means is that you can redirect the light ray. That's really cool. Um, and this is, in fact, how um, you have fiber optics that, for instance, carry the internet in some places. Most of the internet is carried at least somewhere by a fiber optics cable. 
All right, and here you can see an image of a fiber optic cable. Um, often, uh, often, so here if you have a bundle of fiber optics cables, you can actually change the location of an image and whatever you look at through the fiber optics cables you will see on the other end. Um, and you also can use fiber optics cables um, to, for instance, search inside the human body because they're very narrow. So if you've ever had anything, any studies that were done um, with an endoscope, they basically stick a little fiber optic cable in you and they attach a camera to one end of the fiber and then they can look around in your body. All right, and then they are, uh, they're clad, which means covered, in, an, in a material that has a much lower index of refraction than the core to try to ensure the highest efficiency for total internal ref reflection. Now, some of the light will in fact get lost. That's just natural. Um, you can't make a perfect, um, you can't make a perfect fiber optic cable, but you can get pretty close. Um, uh, and this is another application we haven't talked about we, well, we haven't talked about how a prism works, but um, binoculars often work by having a prism which bends the light as it travels through so that what you see, what hit the light ray that hits your eye has not actually traveled a straight path. Um, and you can have light that uh, light hitting a diamond because diamond has a very high index of refraction. Um, so the critical angle is very small, so most light rays are internally reflected. Um, and that means that when you look at a, a diamond that has been cut in the right way, there are, only a certain, there are only a few places that light can exit, which makes it look like the diamond is sparkling. All right, we can also talk about dispersion, which is the separation of colors. So, so far we've talked about it as if all light rays are bent by the same amount, depending only on the material. But this index of refraction, it is wavelength dependent. So um, because the index of refraction is wavelength dependent, when you have, um, when you have light rays, I'm going to draw a, um, I'm going to draw a non straight um, surface. And I have a light ray. Here. And I have a light ray. Let me take a different color. Um, I have a light ray here. In general, Longer wavelength light is not bent as much as shorter wavelength light. Um, it's going to depend on the, on the properties of the material. So my blue light ray is going to be bent. Let me draw how far my red one is bent. My blue light ray is going to be bent more. So exaggerating purposefully. Now that these light rays, so this guy is going to travel off at some angle. In, in general, my blue light is bent more by the medium. So whereas I might have this all the colors moving together when light is incident on the prism, when light um, goes through the prism, it is spread out. Now this can happen as well. The, a droplet of water can act as a prism and the red light is not bent as much as the blue light. So you get, a, you get the light to spread out by colors. This is called dispersion. Um, and um, you'll see now this, the color is not reproduced well in this image, but the colors are identical no matter how you spread light from the sun out. You will always get the same mix of lights. But no, not all light is the same as the sun. So you actually can have sources that are not, um, where you don't see all of the light together. All right, so um, as you spread that light out, now we have broken it historically into six colors, um, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Um, and 
Sometimes you will hear indigo in there and there's six, seven colors. That's an arbitrary distinction because there's no, uh, and here the color, the color in this image is not reproduced correctly because of the, um, because of the processing of the image. But um, your red light has longer wavelengths and your blue light, your blue and violet has sh shorter wavelengths, but there's no hard cutoff for where you call what red and what you call, um, what you call violet. All right, so this shows this in, um, this shows a prism in greater detail. So here you have, um, if you have light that hits a prism which has only one wavelength, then it will exit as one beam from a prism. Um, if you have light that is multicolored hitting a prism, it's going to spread out. Now, many of our lights are not sunlight. If you have, if you have artificial lighting, um, most lights now are um, either halogen or fluorescent, and halogen and fluorescent lights don't have all the colors of the rainbow. It is not pure white light, even though we perceive it as approximately white. So if you use a prism to spread out light from a halogen light bulb or from a, um, from a fluorescent light bulb, you will not see a smooth distribution of all colors. You're only going to see a few colors, a few discrete colors, because that light is actually not pure white light. All right, so here you have a beam of white light, um, which we've now established, probably is not the light that you're seeing inside. You gotta go outside to do this. Um, you have pure light, pure, pure white light or sunlight hitting, um, coming from air, hitting crown glass, which is a particular kind of glass. Um, and it is, um, it is refracted, and then you can calculate how the different angles are refracted. I mean, you can calculate how the different uh, light rays are refracted. So here, um, you're told red and violet, and in your textbook, you are given the, um, the indices of refraction for different, um, different materials based on wavelength. So how you would do this one is you bring out your handy dandy Snell's Law. Snell in Dutch means fast. So sine and n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. We are not going to try to go fast on this. We're going to try to do it meticulously so that we don't make stupid mistakes. So our, um, we are asked to calculate uh, the angle between the red and the violet light, I'm going to first calculate the, the so sine theta 2 is n1 over n2 sine theta 1. Um, and then we're now going to have different colors. So sine theta 2 of red equals n1 n2 red sine theta 1 and we have something similar for the violet And we are going to use that the index of refraction of air is approximately one. It is there is a very slight non a sl, the index of refraction of air is slightly greater than one. Um, it also does depend depend on pressure and the amount of water in the air. Um, and this problem asks us to calculate the difference between the red and the violet. Um, so we would have to calculate, uh, we'd have to use the inverse sine, and we would get that the, the angle for red is 
is 27 degrees. And the angle for violet is 26.4. So that's a rather small angular difference that the, um, the violet light is only deflected by 0.4 degrees relative to the red. That's a teeny tiny difference. All right, so uh, here you can see a diagram of what's happening with a droplet of water when you have a rainbow formed by, uh, by refraction. So sunlight comes in. In this case, we have a spherical surface. Uh, the, this shows what happens to a red, or yeah, this is, the color is off here, so this side is red and that side is violet. You have a red light ray come in, it bounces off, and uh, you end up with, um, the red light is deflected less, the violet light is deflected more from its original trajectory, so the red, the violet light is, um, the violet light ends up separated from the red light. And so this is, um, this happens both when the light enters the water droplet as well as when the light leaves. So in the previous example, we counted a difference of 0.4 degrees. And in this case, when you have a water droplet, you actually have that, that interface with a different, with a change in index of refraction twice, so you get even more dispersion than you would have from just one surface. All right, so uh, because the different colors emerge in different directions, you have to look in different locations to see a rainbow. Or if you are standing and looking up at the sky, what you see is you'll see a, an angle where you see all of the blue light, and you'll see a different angle where you see all of the, um, where you see all of the red light. Okay, now we can move on to Halchen's principle. This is a Dutch guy. Um, I'm probably doing better at pronouncing his name than most Americans, um, but uh, still slightly but butchering it. Uh, Halchen. Um, and what he said is that basically any source of light you can view as a bunch of different coherent, uh, if you have a plane wave, you can view it as a bunch of coherent sources of light all starting on that line. So here, a plane wave is if you have in one, uh, we talked about the nature of light in the last chapter, you have these oscillating uh, electric and magnetic fields. And so if you, um, if you look down on a plane wave traveling, then you're gonna have, uh, at, at any given point, you see wiggles. Some places the electric field is high, some places it's low. Here you can see what the electric field would look like as a function of space traveling, um, traveling uh, in the direction of the plane wave. Um, and then, um, so this is what a plane wave looks like. And then that wave, it hits a surface. So um, you can model that wave instead of being all one, a single wave with troughs and peaks going together, um, you can model it as a bunch of discrete sources so that it, it's just a whole bunch of little point sources. And when you add up the waves, the amplitudes of the waves, mathematically it's the same thing as if you had a single plane wave. So you can think of an, a wave front as, a, as being a whole bunch of point sources. And then you view it as if the sources are moving at a speed equal to the wave. So here you have, this is a point source where stuff is moving out at all directions from the source. And it is going to, to interfere constructively and destructively with all of the other sources. So you add up at some later time what is going on with the wave from all of these different point sources. And you will get a, um, you will get that the wave front itself is moving at a speed of uh, a speed equal to the speed of the wave. So this is this it will become clear when we talk about um, about diffraction why we're talking about this.
because this is a useful picture. All right, so here you can see Halkin's principle applied to a plane wave uh, hitting a mirror. So each of the little wavelets, each source, point source creates a bunch of different waves, um, and they, uh, they add up together to create, um, to create the new wave. So here, wave, as the plane wave hits, um, hits the mirror, these wavelets hit and reflect first, and then these ones hit and reflect later. All right, so if you, view, if you use this to explain, um, you can use this to explain refraction. So here you have a plane wave traveling from one medium to the other, um, and here the, the speed of light is slower. The ray bends towards the perpendicular because the, um, the waves have a lower speed in the second medium. So as soon as they hit here, they're, they're slowing down, whereas the wave fronts from this source hit first. The outcome is the same as my little lawnmower example, which I at least find easier to do in my head quickly. All right, and this is just showing the, um, the geometry um, as you're going from, uh, excuse me, from one surface to the other. All right, so then we can talk about diffraction. So diffraction is what happens when you have light traveling through, when you have a wave traveling through some type of, um, some type of hole, which is, so the hole, not all of the light can, uh, not all of the wave can travel through. So you can actually get diffraction with mechanical waves. We talked about this uh, way back in last semester when we talked about oscillatory motion and light wave and water waves. Now um, we have a wave that has a much shorter wavelength because our wavelength for light is no, um, is no longer than about 700 nanometers. So if you view, um, if you view light as like a ray, and a lot of what we're doing here is viewing light as like a ray, when we treat light as a ray, it's just traveling straight along until some, it hits something and then it bounces off. Um, but we can also view it as these plane waves and there's little point sources. When we uh, talk about diffraction, we have to consider the point sources. Uh, we have to consider what happens to the different parts of the wave interfering as it hits it something. So when you hit, um, you either force the wave through some hole or the wave hits an obstacle, um, then if you had, uh, in classical mechanics, if you had a, if you had a ball, you throw a ball at a hole, it either goes through or it doesn't. But if you have a wave, part of the wave travels through, and then you can get constructive and destructive interference. So um, if, you have, um, if you have a ray, this would be, you would have sharp edges. But if you have a wave, and you instead view this as a wave front, like a water wave, hitting some object, or going through a hole or hitting an object, and then using Halkin's principle, each along this, um, along the um, along the, the path you can go through, it's as if you have a bunch of point sources. And now, if you have a bunch of point sources, as the wave travels through here, you can get interference. So, if you consider this to be like sound sound waves, you actually will get um, you will get excuse me, interference, and there will be parts of the wave that you can hear strongly and um, parts you will hear less strongly, um, but the wave can actually bend going around the corner. If you have a particle view of light and you're, you're thinking of it as a ray, light travels straight. But of course we know from the last chapter, light is in fact a wave. Um, there was a big long debate about whether light was a wave or a particle um, around the turn of the last century. And the answer is yes. Um, so when you look at a scale, on, um, which is large compared to the wavelength of light, um, then, like light traveling around a doorway, a doorway is on the order of one meter, 
And light is on the order of 10 to the negative 7. The wavelength of light is on the order of 10 to the negative 7th meters. It's much, much smaller. So light shining through a doorway will actually appear to travel straight and have sharp edges. If you could look closely enough, you could see ever so that that is not actually a straight edge. But most of the time, we're not looking at things on the scale of hundreds of nanometers. I can't see that well. Um, even with glasses. Now, when you have a water wave or a sound wave, um, sound waves have typical wavelengths on the sound that we can hear has wavelengths that are more like the um, their centimeters. So that those will diffract around the door, and you can actually have sound travel around corners. So here. Um, this is applying Hawkins' principle to a plane wave hitting an opening. The edges of the wave front bend after passing through the opening called diffraction. The amount of bending is more extreme for a small, uh, a small opening or an opening which is small compared to the wavelength of light. So if you want to see this effect for, um, if you want to see this effect for light waves, you need an obstacle on the order of the, um, the diameter of, or the, on the order of the wavelength of light. You actually can get diffraction using your hair. This is a fun freshman laboratory experiment where you use your hair, you shine it, you pull a hair out of your head, you shine a light, a laser through it, and you can actually see diffraction around the, the hair and use that to measure the width of your hair. And we're going to come back to diffraction later. All right, now, polarization. Most of you guys will have at some point had polarized sunglasses. And this is really cool. So if you, uh, so remember, light is an oscillating wave of electric and magnetic fields. The changing electric field induces a change in the magnetic field, and the changing magnetic field induces a changing electric field. So you end up with these um, oscillating electric and magnetic fields. Now, once I've done this, I've had to pick a direction for my electric field and my magnetic field. So um, that direction tells me the polarization of the light. So let's see, I got to have E cross B is the direction. So it, oh, and I got to use my stage right hand. Um, so if E cross, let's see, I want my light to go that way. E cross this is towards me, so E cross B. If my, um, my electric field is in this direction, my magnetic field is in this direction, and then it, the light ray is traveling towards you. So I have, whoop, whoop, ah, this is a hard thing to do. All right, so electric field, then and we would say that my polarization is like this. Now, I can also have polarization like this, and it's still traveling towards you. So um, if this is my electric field, then my polarization is like this. So polarization tells you the direction of the electric field and that the direction is kind of, it, it's an arbitrary choice. You're allowed either. Now, if we have something like polarized sunglasses, polarized sunglasses work by blocking one of those polarizations. So if you have random light from the sun, then the polarization angle is approximately random. There's not any preferred angle for light from the sun. So if you put your sunglasses on, then about half of the polarization of light is this way and about half of it is this way. So putting polarized sunglasses on is going to block preferentially, well, it's gonna block half of the light. But then more importantly, light, which is reflected off of a surface is polarized. So in th this, I encourage you to look at the pictures in the book because this picture doesn't get processed as well um, through this. Um, 
light, which is uh, reflected, there is a preferential direction for the reflection of light. So when you look at, uh, if you are looking at a surface, for instance, the surface of water or um, the reflection off of, of a puddle in a, on a hot, sunny day, um, there is a preferential direction for that light to be reflected. And you put those polarized sunglasses on, they're oriented so that they, dis they block the reflection preferentially so you don't see that glare. That is, um, that is why polarized sunglasses are particularly useful. It's not just that they block the light. Unpolarized sunglasses will block some of the light and you can make unpolarized sunglasses that block half of the light. If you make polarized sunglasses, you have preferentially blocked the light that makes it harder for you to see where to drive, where you're walking. And in general, um, also that light tends to be the stuff that's reflected up and goes straight into your eyes. Okay, so here this shows that the direction of polarization is the direction of the electric field. Um, and because we have that preferential direction, the, for, a given, um, if you, for a given light ray, there's a, um, there's a fixed direction for its electric field. All right, so um, this is analogous to, now I'm, now I'm a wiggling uh, wave on a rope. I wiggle my rope. I can choose to wiggle it this way or this way. If I pass it through a, uh, if I have a great system, and I'm shaking my rope, if I shake it like this, it'll get through, it'll get through my slats. If I shake it like this, the wave will not pass through my slats. Uh, and the way that this is done microscopically in polarized sunglasses is by using very long polymers that in fact make chains like this. There is a preferred direction for the electric field and, um, and in some directions you can get light pass through easily while in others you don't. Okay, so here if you have unpolarized light traveling through your polarizer, by the time you put the, when you shine it at a polarizer um, that only allows one direction through, after it passes through the polarizer, you end up with purely polarized, approximately purely polarized light. Now all of these things, there is no perfect polarizer, so um, you can end up with a little bit of electric field in the other direction just because it's a physical device that doesn't work perfectly. All right, so here, what this shows is that you have uh, unpolarized light traveling through a polarizer, and then you're left with vertically polarized light. If you pass it through um, a polarizer that is lined up with the original polarizer, all of the light will come through on the second try. If you have unpolarized light, you pass it through a polarizer, so now you're left with the half that is um, the half of the light that is polarized vertically. Now you pass it through a polarizer which is horizontally aligned, you will not get any light through. Now I have a po unpolarized light, I pass it through my polarizer. Now I only have vertically polarized light, and now I pass it through a polarizer that is at an angle. Now, I'm gonna let through all of the light um, that has an electric field along this direction. So if this is my electric field and I pass it through a polarizer that looks like this, the electric field that will pass through is the electric field, the component of the electric field which is perpendicular, or sorry, which is parallel to the polarizer. So I, I will look at the projection onto this axis. Um, so then, uh, all of, not, so half of the light travels 
half of the unpolarized light travels through the first polarizer. It's not quite half, but um, you can even say, so this is theta, and this is going to give you an electric field of E cosine theta, and the intensity is proportional to the electric field squared. So the intensity which passes is the initial intensity times the squared of the cosine um, between the, uh, the original polarization and the angle of the polarizer. Now, this leads to another effect, which is that, so if you have two polarizers lined up, all the light that gets through the first polarizer also gets through the second polarizer. If you have two polarizers um, where one of them, it, where the two polarizers are perpendicular, they will totally block the light. But if I took this and I put a third polarizer in, I would get some of the light through. So I am going to start with this electric field. We will call this E0. And now I put it through this polarizer. Let's say that this, well, so this is at an angle theta. And let's just choose theta equals 45 degrees. Now I take my projection and I am left with this, which I will call E1. So that's E naught cosine 45 degrees or E naught over the square root of 2. And now I'm going to add a polarizer. Now I'm going to put it through a third polarizer. So now this polarizer does this. So now I'm asking for the electric field to be perpendicular to the initial electric field. Now I start with this component right here. Uh, my electric field is in this direction, and I take the projection onto my new polarizer. And this, this angle happens to also be 45 degrees. So E2 is E1 cosine 45 degrees, or E naught over 2. So if I insert this polarizer at 45 degrees into this, situa into this scenario, I will actually get because the intensity goes like the square of the electric field, I will actually get a quarter of my light passed through. All right, so here, um, this is just zooming in on more of what we were saying, that the, uh, you look at the angle of the incident electric field um, relative to the polarizer, and you're looking at the projection of that electric field onto the polarizer. All right, so when you have polarization by reflection, um, unpolarized light has unequal amounts of both vertical and horizontal um, polarization. But um, the, uh, the, when you hit a surface, the, uh, the vertical component is preferentially um, absorbed by the surface or refracted. It gets bent more. Um, or it is absorbed. And then the light that is actually reflected is more likely to be the light that is parallel to the surface. So when you have light incident upon a surface and, it ref and some of it reflects, now this is, a, um, this is not a 100%, it's not that 100% of the light ends up polarized relative to the surface, but ref uh, refraction, reflection, um, on refraction, the reflected component of the light is much more in the 
the direction parallel to the surface than perpendicular to the surface. So uh, then you want your polarizing sunglasses to be polarized vertically because you want to block out the light that is, um, that is parallel to the surface because that's from the reflection. And it's that, that light from a reflection that causes glare and makes it hard to, to see. All right, so here you can see uh, long molecules aligned perpendicular to the axis of a polarizing filter. So along this direction, if the electric field is in this direction, it makes it really easy for the electric field to shake and wiggle these molecules, whereas um, if, you are, if your electric field is perpendicular to the molecules, it's really hard for that electric field to deflect the molecules. So the component parallel is preferentially absorbed by this material, whereas the component of light perpendicular to these long molecules is preferentially transmitted. All right, so then here you can see, zooming in, if you have an electric field which is oscillating parallel to these long molecules, it gets them moving and shaking. And if they get the, if they're moving and shaking the, um, the sunglasses, that light is not traveling through. All right, you can also have polarization by scattering because uh, in general, if you hit some, if you have unpolarized light that hits something like molecules of water in the air, um, then the, um, the light will preferentially move in the direction, will preferentially be absorbed if it makes things shake in the direction of the, um, of the original ray. Um, so the scattered light is polarized perpendicular to the original direction. So um, here, if you have light, so unpolarized light hits water, then you are preferentially going to end up with polarized light um, perpendicular to what, uh, to the direction that it was traveling. All right, and this is just zooming in. This is looking at a specific case. You have, oh, this is talking about uh, chiral molecules that you have, if you have polarized light and you pass it through some sample, um, then uh, you can actually get the light rot the polarization rotated by the sample of uh, the sample of light. So rather than so we've talked about it as if you have polarization uh, entirely up or down, um, but you can either talk about polarized light as have consist uh, you can either talk about um, light as having polarization up uh, and down or left and right. Or you can talk about polarized light, which is circularly polarized. Um, and some things preference, so if you have light which is shaking up and down, you can describe it as a combination of, of clockwise and counterclockwise per, circularly polarized light. So instead of the electric field going like this, the electric field is simultaneously oscillating in amplitude and its orientation is rotating. Um, and some molecules, in fact, most organic molecules, preferentially interact with polarized light, um, which means that if you have a polarized source and you, uh, so if you have no sample, you have unpolarized light, you pass it through a polarizer, you are left with vertically polarized light, you pass it through the air or some other sample, and then another um, polarizer, you'd block all of the light. But um, if you have um, if you have a sample that is circular, that preferentially interacts with circularly polarized light, it will rotate the um, electric field of the um, of the light, or preferentially allow one polarization to pass through and the other not to. Um, so you will, when you put your sample in, you will actually see light transmitted. An example of this is honey. So I actually, I keep bees and they will use these polarizers to, uh, they have a, a polarizer here and a polarizer there. And if you have no sample in, no light gets through, you put your honey sample in there, you illuminate it so that you can see through. And 
it makes it really easy to see impurities, like if you had dust in your honey. And they actually used this in, uh, in uh, honey judging competitions to test to see how pretty your honey is. And these, these devices are super expensive, like a, over $100. But you can make them with a pair of sunglasses, $5 sunglasses from Walmart. You just rotate your, take the, glass, the lenses out, rotate them, and then you can check your own honey and see if it looks good. All right, so this is just showing the same, that you have some sample, and it rotates the polarization. And now you can get some light passing through. Um, and here, um, so if you have something like uh, you're putting stress on something like a piece of plastic, plastic, you will also um, you can also use the polarization of the light to, to be able to see where you've got stress on that. And then there's a really cool property called birefringence. So um, when you have birefringent materials. The two different polarizations of light um, get deflected by different angles. So for instance, you may have one polarization passes through undeflected, and the other is shifted. Um, and, they are, um, and what happens is that if you look at an image through this, um, for, uh, for example, calcite, um, then it will split an image up into two different images. So this is one of my, I'm a rock kid. I got into science because of rocks. So I used to have a big calcite crystal and you'd look at, um, you'd try to read through it and you would see the same word twice. It was really cool. Um, all right, and this should say examples. So moving on to examples. Uh, here you have a man standing in front of a mirror as shown below. His eyes are 1.65 meters above the floor, and the top of his head is 1.3 or is 0.13 meters above that. So find the height above the top of the floor. Um, find the height above the floor of the top and bottom of the smallest mirror, which he can see both the top of his head and his feet. All right. So, and how is this distance related to the man's height? If he is here, all right, so this is 0 0.13 meters. We're given that in the problem. And this distance is, 1.65, so if he just barely sees his head, then this is 1.65 over 2, because half he has to be just barely able to see his shoes, and this is 1.65 over two, that's this length, and then up to here is 0.13 over two. All right, so this one says, show that when light reflects from two mirrors that meet each other at right angles, the outgoing ray is parallel to the incoming ray. We actually did a lot of this. Um, I am going to, so we now know, based on what I went through earlier, this is theta 1, this is theta 2, this is theta 2, I can draw this angle then, where at this triangle, this is perpendicular, um, this is a right angle, then this guy right here also has to be theta 2. This triangle is similar to that triangle, so this is theta 1. And then I need the angle, so this makes 
Let me do the angle from here. Ah, and then these, so if this is theta 2 and that is theta 2, then because this line is parallel to that line, then the, um, then this, uh, this line has to be parallel to that line. Obviously, for a homework, you would have to outline your reasoning for, um, for each of those steps. All right. Now, a ray of light emitted beneath the surface of an unknown liquid with air above it undergoes total internal reflection as shown below. Um, what is, and we are just barely at the critical um, at the critical angle. What is the index of refraction for the liquid? and its likely identification. Okay, so now, if this, so we are given both sides of the triangle, and then we want to calculate the sine. So the sine of this angle is the Ah, uh, this one's not showing up there. The sine is the opposite over the hypotenuse. So, opposite is 13.4 centimeters. And the hypotenuse is 13.4, is the square root of 13 point square, 4 squared plus 15 squared. Um, and then uh, then that tells us what sine theta c is, and it is equal to n1 over n2, or n2 equals n, let's see, we need... Ah, sorry, sine theta is the incident is N2 over N1, but for air, is, air is approximately, has an, an, an index of refraction of approximately 1. I need, ah, yes, yeah, so this is 1 over N1. So you can calculate N1 is approximately 1 over the critical sine theta, which is 13.4 squared plus 15 squared square root over 13.4. All right, and this is asking what is the liquid. You can look up in the table uh, in the book what the various indices of refraction are. So that's a real basic problem where you are given angles. You're basically asked to apply Snell's law. At least in my class, you are going to, you're almost guaranteed to have a basic Snell's law problem on the exam. This is a really easy law to memorize. So it's probably worth taking up the brain space and committing it to memory. And I personally always forget what the critical angle is because if I know Snell's law, I can derive it in a couple lines. All right, and then light rays normally fall on the vertical surface of a glass prism as shown in this figure. What is the largest angle for phi such that they are totally uh, reflected at the slanted face? Okay, so this is another one where we want to calculate we're going to use Snell's law, um, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. And then we want to know, so when they're reflected at this face, we'll call this n1, and this is n2. And then we need to do a little bit of geometry. 
So here, this is a right angle. This is an angle phi. And if we have our incident wave, our incident ray uh, travels in. And this is phi. So this is, uh, this is, I'll do a theta. This is phi. This is 90 minus phi. And we want the angle, so where uh, there's total internal reflection. So N1 is greater than N2. So I have to have, so I want sine theta 1 equals, I'm going to equals N2 over n1 when we get critical reflection so it's where the um it's where we get no definable where this guy turns into exactly one um and if n1 is greater then i can at least define this angle so i can i have an angle uh, I have an index of refraction of 1.5, and I'm going to use N2 is approximately 1. So I have sine theta 1. It, it sine theta critical is approximately, is 1 over 1 1.5. And that gives us an angle of 41.2. And then phi is 90 degrees minus 41.2 or 48.8 degrees. All right. And then repeat the part of A if the prism is immersed in water. We're going to go ahead and skip that step. And that concludes our first, uh, our first chapter on light. I hope you found it illuminating.